Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. You are in the webinar for Equitable Dual Enrollment, Lessons from a Community of Practice. We are going to give folks just about a minute or so just to reacclimate to this next webinar or Zoom meeting or wherever they're coming from. So we appreciate you spending your morning with us and part of your afternoon. Uh, we'll get started in just a moment. In the meantime, if you want to put your name, college, um, and a greeting in the chat, you're more than welcome to. And we'll get started briefly. Thank you so much again for joining us. All right, so we are at 1101. Again, welcome everyone. This is the Equitable Dual Enrollment Lessons from a Community of Practice webinar. I'm Laurencia Walker from the Career Ladders Project. And to get us started here with a welcome we have from the Chancellor's Office, Dr. Woodyard. Dr. Woodyard, please. Thank you so much, Laurencia. I really appreciate it. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to this very eventful um, webinar today uh, on equitable uh, dual enrollment. This project, Community of Practice, is an effort on part of the Chancellor's Office to provide uh, leadership and uh, model examples of doing dual enrollment. The work that this team has undertaken has been highly significant. Our incoming Chancellor has identified dual enrollment as a major goal. She has three major goals. This is goal number one to uh, significantly expand dual enrollment in the California Community Colleges, the Kern County Community College District, which she is leaving to, to start uh, her role as the chancellor for the system, uh, has significant dual enrollment uh, opportunities uh, there, and she would like to see this expanded. So the work that you're doing um, in the field and would be benefited from the work that this uh, community of practice is, is undertaking. And the purpose of today is to share that information with you, share that work, answer questions, and help lead to charge into the future. So with that, I will turn it back over to Laurencia and uh, we can get started. Lorencia, you are muted, my friend. Thank you for that. Just checking, making sure everyone's uh, with us this morning. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Castro. Um, again, this is uh, sponsored and uh, hosted today by the Career Ladders Project. Uh, our organization focuses on equity-minded community college redesign. So we work with colleges, their high school partners, their industry partners, uh, four-year and community partners to look at ways to improve um, anything from policy to practice as it relates to improving outcomes for students in their post-secondary goals. And so that's a little bit about CLP. We encourage you all to um, check out our website and uh, attend our webinars as you please. Uh, this is our CLP team that is here supporting you here today. Um, shout out to everyone uh, in CLP making this happen today. Thank you all for your support. Um, so a little bit about uh, today, we have a packed agenda. We're together for about an hour and a half. Um, again, please feel free if you haven't already done so to put your name and your uh, institution or organization in the chat so that we can uh, see who's here today. Uh, we're going to give you an overview of our community of practice uh, for dual enrollment, how we arrived uh, at establishing one, and some of the conversations around that. We are going to highlight some of the great work uh, that's uh, being done by some of the members of the community of practice from Mendocino, Riverside, and Southwestern College. We're going to have an opportunity for you all to ask them some questions. And then we're also going to uh, review uh, some of the state grants. So some of you may be in the throes of writing for those right now. So we're going to do a brief overview um, of those, uh, as well as a report that we are going to be publishing uh, that relates to dual enrollment that may be of use. Um, and then at the end of that, there'll be another opportunity for Q&A time permitting. And then we will close. So again, packed agenda for you here today, but hopefully it's uh, maximizing your time that you're spending with us. Next slide, Adair, please. 
So just to do some grounding, um, there's been a lot of advancements in terms of policy as it relates to dual enrollment. Um, so there's been incredible opportunity to expand who dual enrollment now uh, is for. Um, it used to be uh, for one type and one group of students. Now there's an opportunity to expand access to a greater number of students uh, for dual enrollment. And there's policy and even law now that we can cite that creates those opportunities. And we're seeing more and more throughout colleges uh, integrating dual enrollment within their um, policies and practices. And it's even as far as the, in the CCC roadmap. So you're seeing a lot more opportunity to give greater opportunity to students at access higher to higher education by way of dual enrollment. With that, on the next slide, we know that there's a plethora of opportunities to uh, implement dual enrollment. So there's different types from early college to middle college models. There's the CCAP opportunities, and then there's students coming to college on their own um, and the individual uh, status uh, in terms of dual enrollment. Uh, we also know uh, that based on most recent research that CCAP, College and Career Access Pathways forms of dual enrollment at the high school are the greatest opportunities to scale. Um, and in that sense, also the greatest opportunity to increase equitable access to dual enrollment by way um, of CCAP is, is an area that we definitely wanted to highlight. So given the policy advancements, given the plethora of opportunities, we wanted to partner with the uh, chancellor's office to get this community of practice going to see what is this all looking like in an equitable manner in practice. So on the next slide, you'll see the great um, chancellor's office team that we were able to work with, specifically also working with the IEP, IEPI division to see how we can uh, design a community of practice um, and then also evaluate uh, the design and function of that community of practice so that we can spread those uh, learnings throughout uh, the, the field. Um, on the next slide, you also see in terms of the evaluation, we're able to work with the great partners at the Ed Insights team. So shout out to them, giving us real-time uh, feedback on our uh, work. And so thank you to them as well. So in terms of the purpose of the community of practice, right here, you can see that it was to address key implementation issues and expanding equitable dual enrollment, um, including uh, creating a plan to increase equitable dual enrollment throughout the partnerships of the sites that we worked with. So one is to create an exposure of the opportunity uh, to expand dual enrollment equitably and also work with them and give them uh, examples and resources to create a plan to uh, put those thoughts into action. And so we uh, set uh, out on this endeavor with a few sites that you'll see on the next slide. Um, we looked at regional diversity in terms of and sites to be a part of the community of practice. So you see in the far north, we have Mendocino. In the Central Valley, we have uh, Merced and West Hills Colinga. Um, in the more Southern region of our state, um, we have in the Inland Empire, Riverside City College, and in the Southern area, Southwestern College. So in selecting these sites, again, we looked at regional diversity. We also looked at their composition of special admits, the diversity of their special admits, compared to the general student population, as well as where dual enrollment is mentioned throughout college plans, uh, whether it's their enrollment management plan, their um, student equity and achievement plans, and things of that sort were all um, a part of uh, that criteria in working with the chancellor's office and Ed Insights and the uh, designing and selecting the sites to participate in the community of practice. So with that, um, on the next slide, uh, you can see we had our launch in September. And as part of that launch, we um, had some of the senior executives uh, from the sites just to give them an overview of the community of practice. But then we also got down to work and really looked at uh, brainstorming and talking with the practitioners to look at what their aspirations were as it relates to dual enrollment. Um, if they could change one thing about their dual enrollment, either partnership or practices, and then a specific practice that they wanted to grow, maybe something that they're doing really good or something that they're very proud of uh, with their dual enrollment um, opportunities, uh, what would they want to grow? And so we took all of that information. You can see a glimpse of that in that screenshot of the mural board um, to the left there. We took that information and used that to inform the various topics throughout the weeks of um, and months of October to May uh, when we meet monthly with the community of practice. Those were the topics that we decided to focus on. So defining and looking at the different types of dual enrollment, 
looking at data, for example, the Jumpstart Report by Education Trust West and other publicly available data, um, funding opportunities, you'll hear a little bit more about that and some upcoming ones uh, that we share with the partnerships, engaging stakeholders, program opportunity and design, student supports, professional development. Um, and again, with all those topics, we looked at bringing in promising practices, scholarly research, various reports, um, and really just create an opportunity for folks to talk amongst one another, um, to learn from one another. Again, it's the colleges and their high school partners that are engaged in this space. And so um, enough of me talking with the overview. We want you to hear from the wonderful practitioners what they're doing in practice. And so these are the folks you'll hear from today, Vice President Rachel Fisher from Southwestern College, Dr. Adrian Grayson, Associate Dean from Riverside City College, and Dr. Amanda fox -Zhu from uh, Mendocino College as their Dean of Centers. These are the leaders at their campus for dual enrollment. And so you'll hear a little bit more about what they're each doing. And so as you're listening, feel free to um, populate the chat with any questions you might have, and then we will follow up to make sure you get some of those answers. And so with that, uh, on the next slide, we will begin with our first college, uh, Vice President Fisher, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Laurencia, and uh, welcome everybody. It's great to be here uh, with you this morning and share a little bit about our about, about Southwestern College and our dual enrollment uh, programs and um, really our vision and where we wanna be because that's what the community of practice has really helped us hone in on. Uh, so Southwestern College, for any of you who don't know us, I know there's a Southwest LA College, that's not us. We are um, way down in the very Southwest corner of the state. Um, we have five locations. Our largest campus is in Chula Vista. And then we have um, four, uh, we have three higher education centers and then an aquatic center. Uh, so two of our higher education centers are uh, right on the border of Mexico uh, and um, uh, and then our Coronado uh, Aquatic Center is uh, located in Coronado. And our, our annual enroll, enrollment is 22,971 last year. And just a little bit of detail about kind of, you know, what, who, who we are. 62% um, of our students are part-time students. 64% are under 25 years old. And then 65% of our students receive financial aid. And then on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see that, um, that our, our student population demographics, and we are predominantly Hispanic, Latinx. Um, and then you can see the other demographics um, of our student population on the right-hand side. And that's important because um, while we, in a, an upcoming slide, I'll show you our dual enrollment participation. And you know, we compare our student demographics along with our high school demographics to really see you know, which student populations are not participating at the same level uh, in the dual enrollment opportunities. Next slide. And then a little bit about our dual enrollment. Um, we have a vision to uh, extensively grow our, our dual enrollment uh, programs. And in the next slide, I'll speak to a little bit about that and our vision and how we're really, how we've restructured our student affairs division specifically to support the growth of dual enrollment. And of course, Whenever a college is restructuring, it, it can take some time to really get all of that, all of those plans implemented. So we are probably maybe 50% of the way implemented. So we've still got a little bit ways to go with our reorganization um, to where we'll be able to really see the fruits of our labor. Um, but overall, you, you'll see the five-year trend of our dual enrollment headcount. Um, we were doing pretty well and then COVID hit and then our, our high school students really did have a challenge, especially when we were offering um, the remote courses. Uh, and then even just, you know, coming back last year when we had more in-person classes, um, they, they just had a little bit less interest in it. I think they were themselves getting used to getting back into the classroom. Uh, so we're hoping to exceed the 2019, 2020 numbers, um, but even really we wanna, we wanna double, triple those numbers in the near future. Um, one of the things that you'll notice it on the, the kind of second chart on the left is the gender participation. So that is an area that we're focusing on as well. You can see that it's uh, 60, you know, 60 percent female participation, 38 percent male participation. And that's, you know, that's a, an equity gap that we want to work on. Uh, and then you'll see on the right hand side that this is our race ethnicity uh, data for dual enrollment. Um, 
participation and what we've really uh, honed in on with the help of the community of practice is looking at uh, different sources of data and we've identified our disproportionately impacted populations within dual enrollment and um, black our black African American students are one of those populations our American Indian Alaskan Native and then also our Hawaiian Pacific Islander and you'll see we don't have the numbers for that because the populations are very small for those last two um, but we know that they're um, Internally, we can see the data and we know that um, those are also disproportionately impacted student populations. Overall, we have two school districts that are in our service area. One is a very small school district, Coronado. Uh, the other one is, is our largest school district, and that has um, 14, um, 14 schools, some alternative schools, and then four adult schools. And then additionally, we work with about six charter schools. So all in all, that's about 24 school sites that we work with. And um, predominantly, we are using the CCAP model in addition to the concurrent enrollment where students are coming to our campus to take courses. Um, with that concurrent enrollment, we're happy that uh, we now, I think we're on our second semester of, of some of those adult school students participating in those concurrent enrollment opportunities. Uh, that has been a, a slow start um, kind of intentionally because we've been working with our adult school um, partners and really in, in understanding what their student population needs with regards to support in the entire process um, with, you know, as from start to start, uh, paperwork start and interest start, and then also getting, you know, of course, through the, the course completion. So we really consider that a pilot program because we were really checking in with them very often to ensure that we are providing as much wraparound support as possible to make those dual enrollment students um, successful in their, their participation in the program. Next slide. And then the work that we've done with our equity plan, um, it really started about, uh, I, I believe our first meeting was a little bit more than a year ago. Uh, so before we joined the community, community of practice, we started what we call a CCAP and dual enrollment advisory group. Um, oh, I apologize, it was in December of 2021. So it was a little bit more than a year ago. Uh, and the objectives were really in line with this, you know, with the CCAP legislation. We are, have heard the call from the chancellor's office and we're working on that call. Uh, so it was to increase the dual enrollment pathways, increase overall participation, but specifically the participation of students who have not historically participated in dual enrollment opportunities and closing those equity gaps. So that's the charge of our advisory group. We meet monthly and that advisory group is made, it, it's a very large group. We have about 25 attendees every month and it's a, it's a mix of our, our team members from the college side, so faculty, deans, um, student affairs support team members, uh, but also on our high school partner side, uh, we've got the charter schools, the small school district, uh, and, then, uh, and then the large high school district as well as our county department of education. So we started meeting uh, monthly and really the first thing we did was we started to look at our data. Uh, and then we started to look at other models, models of where we, you know, who we, who do we want to be when we grow up with dual enrollment? Uh, and so, like, for example, Bakersfield came in and presented uh, all of their amazing uh, dual enrollment models. And, and then we really started to have the brainstorming and conversations around, you know, how do we, we know, we know where we want to go, and how, but how do we get there? And what are the challenges and barriers that are inhibiting us um, from getting there? So it was a lot of good conversation, um, and that really was kind of the kickstart of our work with our high school partners. I wouldn't call it easy work, um, and it's not going to be overnight work either. There's a lot of work to put into it, a lot of time that's that's needing to put into it, um, but we're well on our way of, of um, starting to really implement uh, the changes that we think will lead to really accelerating our dual enrollment programs. Uh, so. Yeah, we identified the disproportionately impacted populations. The other piece of data that was really important is we looked at our capture rates from our high schools. So you know, which high schools were having uh, the highest number of students that weren't going anywhere after graduation, after that year of graduation. Um, and, and so that's really where we've um, honed in 
on schools that have the, the larger population of our disproportionately impacted student populations, and but then also the schools that have the, the, highest, uh, the highest rate of students that aren't going anywhere uh, after uh, the high school graduation. So we identified uh, challenges and barriers, we brainstormed solutions, and then we have a draft equity action plan that we are working on and continuing to work on and hopefully we'll have finished by May. Um, some of those, uh, those um, solutions that we have um, really worked on implementing is increasing staffing. So we know that one of the main challenges for the growth of our dual enrollment program is that our high school counselors are very overwhelmed and they really need us to have boots on the ground and be there to, to, to help the students provide wraparound support and that high touch support, walk them through the, the process and really guide them through that paperwork application and dual enrollment agreement process. Uh, so we have increased our staffing. Uh, we we I, more than doubled our peer ambassadors that go to the high schools. We have 26 peer ambassadors now that work um, with the high schools. We have um, new classified positions, two additional classified positions that are currently in recruitment, so not quite yet to fruition, but, but coming. And then we just uh, last night approved our new director of dual enrollment and um, outreach, which is a position that we haven't had for over uh, 15 years at the college. So really exciting to increase that staffing. We're working on pilots. Um, so we selected schools uh, to create pathways and, and schools to focus on the equity work. And we really uh, identified the ones with those lowest capture rates and then the higher number of uh, Black African-American students. And so we're working on really uh, uh, individual meetings, lots of individual meetings with those schools to determine which pathways will work for their, uh, with, for their specific school site, and then how can we increase the participation of those, uh, of those students. And um, we are really excited uh, that these grants that we're going to talk about at the end of the webinar are coming, um, are, have been released and are, are coming to fruition because our high school partners, uh, our, our high school partner is going to apply for one to start a middle college at our San Ysidro Higher Education Center. So that's very exciting. Um, all of our work is embedded in our student equity and achievement plan as well. Um, we're working with a partner um, to build up, to help us build a community engagement plan with our Black African American uh, community. And so that's really gonna feed into our overall outreach, but definitely also our dual enrollment outreach plans. Uh, we are having deep conversations about what math courses we can offer for dual enrollment uh, and, and what specifically, will, you know, in specific math courses that will help um, the students that aren't on the, on the four-year um, university plan. So we really want to en engage the students that aren't the high performers. And then we're also um, wanting to offer African-American history courses to those, uh, to those schools that have the higher Black African-American population. And then the, the need that, that one of the most challenging needs, because it's going to be the longest time to implement, is there is a need for technology. Um, our high school partners, as I mentioned, are um, stretched thin. They don't have time to, to, to walk the students through the process and, and even keep track of the students. So we are manually tracking everything and then trying to provide them with updates. But with 30 to 34 sections a semester and, and tight timeframes, um, that's a challenge. And so we're looking at a, a CRM that will allow us to build individual porter, portals for the high school sites where they'll be able to see, okay, here are all my students that I've identified for this class. They've completed the application or they've not. And then have they completed that, you know, dual enrollment agreement form or is that still hanging out there with somebody's signature pending? Next slide. And then just some of the um, final words that the amazing support that the community of practice has provided us is it's a, it's it's allowed us to share our challenges and we have many, <laughs> um, but also successes with the other schools. So it really is and it, it gives you the ability to really learn from one another. Uh, and and it's, it's amazing what you'll find that other schools are doing. 
Um, then also the support with the data and strategies. Um, that's been amazing. There's been so many brainstorming sessions. Lorencia kind of showed some images of those um, and that's been tremendously helpful. But it's also really guided our conversation and our actions in that advisory group. I mean, it's been amazing um, to really, it, it, it sets our it kind of sets our agenda up once we once we joined the community of practice, it was really easy to keep that advisory group going. And then um, it really helps us keep our focus on that on equity and paced our progress with the equity plan because I think without it, we may not be as far along as we are today. Uh, and then tracking those upcoming funding opportunities was extremely helpful because we were able to give our partners the heads up on that. And, and we can continue to give them a heads up every month during our advisory group meetings um, so that now they are applying and, and they're looking to apply for a grant for each school site, which is amazing. Uh, and then it really overall just validates the work that you're doing because when you're just doing it, within your college and your community, um, it's it's amazing to really have a much larger group validate that work. And that's all I have, I'll turn it over to Laurencia. Great, thank you, Vice President Fisher. It's so great to hear what Southwestern has going on. And I was able to join one of those um, advisory meetings and they are uh, packed full of uh, committed educators. So that's a great space and happy to, to support. Um, next, we will turn it over to Dr. Grayson and Riverside City College. Hello, thank you everyone. Thanks for inviting me to um, share some of the great things that we're uh, that's going on at Riverside City College. Um, we are located in the Inland Empire, which is uh, Region 9 of the California Community College System, um, where it's about uh, 450 square miles for our district, so we're a multi-college district. We, our sister colleges are Norco College and Moreno Valley College. Um, but RCC specifically serves about 30,000 students annually, um, and this has been the case for over many years, and of course it goes up and down, but it's about 30,000 students. Um, many, uh, most of the students are under the age of 25, um, but, and uh, about a fifth of our students are first-time students, um, and many of them receive financial aid. Most of them receive financial aid. Um, one thing to note, though, that Inland Empire tends to to have a very low um, college going rate that many of the colleges and universities are working together to um, directly address. So you'll see that less than 30% of Riverside County's population um, has at least an associate's degree. And so this is something that um, is at the forefront of everyone's mind as we are designing our classes, as we're partnering or designing our, our course um, offerings, um, working with our partners um, and just you know, figuring out what would be the best way to um, you know, increase access to higher education for our students. And you'll see that we are about 67% um, Latinx um, and, um, and about 8% African-American. You can go on to the next slide. Um, so in terms of dual enrollment at RCC, um, there have been some programs that we've had for many years, and then there's some that are really just, you know, taking, taking flight right now. So um, mo our largest dual enrollment program is CCAP by far. Oh, and please know that this pie chart is not drawn to scale, right? But I just wanted to represent that um, CCAP is our largest dual enrollment program. We have um, three school districts that we work with, with over 10 um, high schools. To, um, we're expanding more to our alternative schools and continuation schools. So that number is growing within those three school districts. Um, and, um, and one of our, uh, one of our programs that we're most pro proud of is our nursing fast track program where students um, are able to take um, the prerequisites for the nursing program, then they're able to get priority enrollment into that nursing program. And we've expanded to include um, the certified nursing assistant program on the campus. And, um, but some of the programs that have, but concurrent enrollment is growing. Um, and of course, you know, we have individual students taking concurrent enrollment classes all the time. Um, but we have our Gateway College and Career Academy, which is an alternative high school, so early college high school um, at 
uh, on the RCC campus, and that's been around since 2004. And then we also have um, the Rubido Early College High School, which is offered at Rubido High School, and we call that Reaches, and that's been around since 2007. So we have some really strong models. Um, and as Vice President Fish Fisher mentioned, um, about um, expanding our dual enrollment to our adult school students. That is something that um, we're very excited about, also expanding um, dual enrollment classes to our um, um, carceral impacted students um, working with Riverside County Office of Education. Um, these are, are areas that we're that we're wanting to grow and new partnerships that we're that we're trying to develop. Um, we haven't um, been able to offer CCAP classes with those um, institutions yet. So right now they're just taking concurrent enrollment classes and we're, we're still developing that partnership, developing the agreements, um, uh, figuring out roles and responsibilities, but um, we're really excited about the growth. Okay, next um, slide. So you'll see that um, our CCAP program has been growing. We started very small um, with about 146 students back in fall 2018. Um, and um, I was brought on in um, spring of 2021. And since I've been, been on board, um, our dual enrollment programs have just exploded. Um, CCAP has exploded. Um, and so, uh, so prior to that, there wasn't anyone in this role to help guide those conversations, to be a resource for the high schools. And so, um, so it's been very eye-opening to be in this role to see how folks, it, I mean, really, um, really just the labor of love, folks doing this because they believe in the program, they believe in the opportunities for the students. And, um, and so it's growing. And so now we're at a capacity issue, right? So not an issue, but it's, it's a good place to be in. Um, but it, it does cause us to want to take pause for a little bit, right? Pause and see how we can improve the program, how we can improve what, what are the different pain points um, that folks are going through, whether at the college or at the high school level, and, um, and then be able to to uh, brainstorm solutions as VP Fisher mentioned. One of the, the issues that we were having was, um, you know, class efficiency, you know, how many students, you know, are actually enrolled in each of the classes. And so how many sections do we need? And so really figuring that stuff out is very, very important as we continue um, to grow our program. Okay, you can, next slide. So I'm sure these numbers are, are very reflective of, of many other, um, CCAP programs, um, our CCAP students tend to have higher success rates than the general population at RCC. Um, you'll see um, that, you know, some of the areas uh, where our, our students are just really, when you look at um, comparing the demographics, um, our CCAP students are just, are really knocking it out of the park. However, we will see, we do see that we have, um, some disproportionate impact with our African American and Latinx students, and that is something that uh, the community of practice is helping us to really, you know, put a laser beam focus on um, to work to improve. Okay, next slide. So you'll see. Um, <clears throat> so we, I mentioned our Rubido Early College program, Early College High School. That's um, that's at Rubido High School right there. That's one of our former students. Um, and so we found that our that our RCC CCAP numbers do not reflect the numbers of Latinx and African American students um, at the high schools in our service area. Um, and for our Latinx students, it could be um, below by by as much as eleven percentage points for each, for each of the districts. And for our African American students, it can be below one percent or about three percent. Um, for, for that particular area, but as you saw, the success rates, so we have an access issue and then we also have a success issue, right? So we wanna make sure that um, we're supporting our students who are in the program. So participating in the um, community of practice has really helped us to, um, to uh, put a, a, like I mentioned, a laser beam focus on these areas. Um, it provides an opportunity to directly address access and success issues for um, specific groups. Um, and, and we're openly reviewing and sharing data. Um, you know, many, much of the data that I get is from, you know, the California Department of Education. The schools have been sharing the data that they have with me. Um, and then uh, I work with our district and our institutional effectiveness office to make sure that our, um, that our data uh, are aligned. 
And, um, and it also helps move the conversation beyond onboarding challenges. And so um, that's something that I feel we, you know, we all share um, in terms of uh, the issue with, you know, CCC apply. We all know what that <laughs> what that is and what that looks like for our high school students completing that first hurdle and then you know the turning in the paperwork getting everything done as BP Fisher mentioned it's all done manually um, and so you know providing those numbers to help the high school stay on track with their enrollment um, it's all it's all manual and we have a very 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 small team um, that um, does our best to to keep up and so we we recognize that there are a lot of onboarding challenges, and sometimes the conversation doesn't um, get beyond that because, um, as mentioned previously, our high school counselors are doing the best that they can. They're they are just rock stars, and there's only so much that they can do. And you know they have other aspects of their jobs, and so um, oftentimes the conversation gets stopped at the onboarding issues. And, um, and so th this community practice has helped us to really expand that conversation to the other issues that, that we need to also focus on because there's some parts of the onboarding that unfortunately we just cannot get around right now. So how do we, how do we work through them, of course, and then also how do we um, um, get beyond that and talk about um, some of the other ways that we can help improve the program? And so has that helps us with that open dialogue, sharing new approaches. It's wonderful to watch the school districts talk to each other and share some of the, the new things that they're working on, you know, uh, you know, prep courses, et cetera. And then it also helps decrease with isolation so that the schools know that they're not alone. The counselors are not alone. Um, the uh, the representatives at the school districts are not alone. Um, and so we're all here to support each other. And so that's been one of the greatest benefits that I've seen. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Grayson. I had the great opportunity to be in one of the meetings with Dr. Grayson. And it was just awesome to see one district said, hey, this is what we're doing. And then another colleague said, hey, can you share a copy of that? We would want to do that too. So it's great to see um, the, the leadership Dr. Grayson provides to create those spaces as well. Um, and with that, we will go to our next um, site, Mendocino College and Dr. Zhu. Thank you. All right, hi folks. As I shared, my name's Amanda, and I'm the Dean of Centers, and I have a, adopted dual enrollment as well in my role. So I want to share a little bit first about Mendocino College. So Mendocino College is a very small rural community college in Northern California. I'll show you a map here on the next slide. But just to know what students we're working with, which includes our dual enrollment students, there's a higher amount of poverty. Um, Lake County actually has the lowest uh, median income in California, and our college going rate is uh, much lower in both Mendocino and Lake counties than the state average. You can see we're looking at about 40% where it should be in 65. Next. So this is another map of Mendocino College. So we are a two county single uh, college district. Um, we service 3,200 miles. There's no four year university in our region. Um, we are currently working with 18 different high schools that are part of 15 different high school districts. So you can imagine a lot of very different small rural schools in our service area. In fact, um, one of our schools, Whale Gulch, has 12 high school students and others have 36, others have 100, 200, 500, and our largest is at about 1,500 students. If you were to take all of our high school students, not current dual enrollment students, but our potential access to high school students, that's 4,820 students. So it's a very dispersed rural region. So that's who we are. Next. This is our timeline with dual enrollment. So we really started about almost 10 years ago where we started on our coast with Fort Bragg High School with um, having open enrollment uh, college classes at the site. And then we were able to expand to additional sites. And we were then developed this kind of um, community of educators as the North Lake Education Partnership to really delve in to having a wraparound support system for students. Part of that was the development of our first CCAP agreement. Um, we continue to have this practice and we're able to bring in um, folks from even outside of our district through agreements with other community colleges. And then during the pandemic, 
we were able to really focus on how to bring people together through the format that we're in today. So as you can see, there's no driving from some of our distances. Some of our schools are, you know, one, two hours away from any of our physical sites. And so we're able to bring practitioners together through Zoom. And that's where we really got some great momentum of bringing in a lot of good practitioners to have conversations and move things forward. Um, and then kind of in the last few moments, we've had the honor of joining this um, career ladders dual enrollment community of practice and we have learned a great wealth of information from our fellow practitioners. Each one of us in this room is doing something amazing with dual enrollment. We all are. And if we can just learn what those different things are and integrate it into our own programs, we'll all be better for it. Um, we just completed our 14th CCAP agreement and one of our high schools was a recipient of the California Exemplary Dual Enrollment Award. Next. So I've been in my current role since 2018, and we've made a lot of good practice with the pathways and focused and targeted support of students. And in that time, we've been able, able to increase uh, dual enrollment headcount about 100%, going from 500 students to over 1,000. And in, again, this is in a very rural area where we only have access to about you know, 5,000 students total at the high schools. Next. So as I shared, we got a lot of momentum as we brought folks together. We were first able to do this in Lake County because our high schools were somewhat of a drivable distance and we did this physically on ground. We had meetings with key stakeholders. We have superintendents, principals, high school and college counselors, college learning center director, our county office of education have been great partners. We are also part of a K-16 Redwood Coast Collaborative. So we also have partners from our four years at Humboldt and Sonoma State. We're also really key in involving our industry partners, and we have our college liaison for industry involved as well. So part of this whole group, we look to, you know, focus in on Lake County, and as I shared before, we're able to expand to our other regions through uh, virtual meetings. We were able to develop pathways, and we had good, strong conversations with our full-time faculty to envision what that would be. And we also share a lot of our college student support systems as guest speakers at these meetings with these key stakeholders to share, you know, Mendocino College has a uh, food pantry. How can we make that accessible to dual enrollment students and to actually put that into place, as well as other st student support systems such as our MESA program or our Native American Resource Center to make that accessible at each of our high school sites. Um, we focused on onboarding for students, but also for faculty. Uh, we established data collection to see, you know, how are students doing, where are they going after college, how can we better support a solidified warm handoff to either the four-year university or to Mendocino College as their community college option. And one way that we've done this is with the next slide. So just last Thursday, we had our second um, annual college and career day. It was raining, so we were inside a big party tent, and we had about 250 to 300 high school students join us at our Lake Center campus. And in collaboration with our Lake County Office of Education, we're able to throw a really an amazing event. We had local industry partners, we had faculty from both career education and um, academic trajectories. We had the local Kiwanis group and we had um, student services to make uh, it audible how students can actually access and participate in this. Um, so it was a really wonderful event. We continue to do this in the future for each of our regions. Next. And as I shared, we worked really hard to develop clear cut pathways with a goal of making these accessible and available to eighth grade parents so that they can work with their um, child to plan their future. And we did this based on labor market projections for our region and looked at percent change, annual median income, education requirements. And in addition, we've communicated local industry need. Do we actually have the faculty available? I know lots of times that can be a hurdle. And then student interest, there could be all the need in the world, but if the students don't want to participate, then it's not gonna be successful. And through that, we were able to identify and develop pathways. And we did this with each of our regional high schools and it's tailored and it's specific to their interests. And so you can go ahead and go to the next slide. 
And so this is an example of our pathway map with Fort Bragg High School, where we started dual enrollment. And you can see that it starts with a college career success class that every single freshman takes. And this is something we've tried to roll out at the rest of our sites. And this introduces them to dual enrollment and planning for their future and determining if they want to be part of the I get C transfer pathway or part of their individual career education pathway. And this is shared with parents and helps them better understand the cost saving as well as exactly where this is getting their child on their career education um, journey. Uh, next. And so the next slide is just another example. Previously, I shared our uh, transfer pathway, but we're also very focused in on career education. And this is an example from our local newspaper about one of our continuation schools. 36, 36 students are in this continuation school, and we have a very robust um, culinary um, pathway at this site in addition to transfer opportunities. And there is shown uh, Chef Petty, he's our full-time culinary instructor, and he is very supportive of this program. And it's been an amazing, life-changing opportunity for students who did not identify as college students and now are. Next. Another resource that has been really helpful is by building a dual enrollment ambassador program. So we work with a current dual enrollment student who's a junior and a senior at each site, and they help with some of the on the ground challenges that we, our staff just couldn't support. Things that come up all the time that students just need a little quick question for, and they're there to help that. And so you can see one of our students here on the first day of a dual enrollment class, kind of introducing fellow dual enrollment students as to what that is how to access their Mendocino College email, how to get onto Canvas, what kind of student services are available through our college, as well as sharing a um, orientation video provided by the college. We've also generated um, student and parent orientation videos that are on YouTube that can be checked out at any time, and we've uh, made those available in English and Spanish. Um, one of the big things we like to develop with our dual enrollment ambassadors is just having folks do have a college student identity and so every single student we're working towards having them have a Mendocino College student ID just a little you know card with their face on it connected to a college can do a lot and we also have a welcome package for every single student which has some snacks and then a card linked to a QR code that goes up to our individual site high school center um, dual enrollment page next and for equity and inclusion, that has been a key focus since we've begun this. Um, through this community of practice, an article was shared that I highly recommend everybody take a look at. It's this uh, jumpstart setting goals to drive equitable dual enrollment. And in this, we're able to see that our focus on having this college career success class open to every single student, we're having a really good representation of our demographics in our dual enrollment program. We have high representation in our Native American population, our Latinx population, and our African American population. And specifically for our Native American population, um, we have the greatest representation of students in that area in the community college system. And students are really enjoying this opportunity. I have a quote here from a student that is just so appreciative of this being available in their small rural school when many times there's not many resources and very much available to them. And now we have students who are finishing certificates and getting AAs in high school. Next. And success is always really important. So overall, as a college, 72% of our students uh, pass their class. However, in dual enrollment, that's much higher because of the wraparound support from the college, from the high school, from our student services, from everyone, and we see really good success rates there. Next. So I've just scratched the surface on kind of our programs. If you're interested in hearing more, my team and I are going to be speaking at the CCC AOE conference, specifically focusing in on how we were able to integrate a uh, career education into our dual enrollment opportunities. And then this will be brought up later, but I'll also be speaking at the California Dual Enrollment Equity Symposium about how we specifically have supported and engaged our Native American population. 
And if you have any questions, you're free to email me and it's listed there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhu. And um, I know Amanda shared that she's over a vast region, um, but she does a great job maximizing technology to get a whole bunch of folks on a Zoom call and they are present. So uh, again, great, great advice from Amanda, as well as Dr. Grayson and Vice President Fisher. And so with this, we are now going to turn it over to the Q&A. Uh, we're going to start with a question and then we're going to field a few that you all have shared uh, with us. And then uh, we will go on with the program. So first question to our uh, featured speakers today. Um, for folks that may be wondering, how do you even start the conversation about equity and dual enrollment? Um, what advice do you have um, for them? What would be sort of a first step or um, something that they would need to do to begin those conversations or something that you did uh, specifically as it relates to dual enrollment and equity? Vice President Fisher, would you mind starting off? Thank sure, you. Sure. Um, I guess the first step would be to make sure you've got the right folks at the table to discuss. Um, the conversations probably would start internally with just the college, but of course we want to make sure we bring in, you know, the high school partners because one of the, I, I know there's a few uh, colleges, I think Imperial Valley is one of them where um, they actually at the college level determine which high school students are taking their courses dual enrollment courses, but for us, it's it's the high schools that are deciding. Um, so that presents a little bit more of a challenge. So we we needed to make sure that the that, that the high schools and the districts were um, were included in the conversation, and then kind of tied to that, then we started to review the data. So that very first advisory board meeting that we had, um, I ensured that our uh, that our wonderful institutional research department had provided us with lots of data that we were able to share with, um, with the advisory board. Great, thank you. How about you, Amanda, any recommendations? Yeah, so I think, you know, just being aware of where you're at and really trying to address any missteps or areas that aren't supported. So we've really focused in on having as much bilingual support as we can have from the beginning making sure that there are, you know, community representatives. I think that's really important, you know, kind of like our dual enrollment ambassadors, students listen to students in a way they'll never listen to us. And folks in the community listen to folks in the community in a way they'll never listen to us. And so just really getting partners that are key in your region. Um, I know for like our larger Native American population, we have a high school right next to uh, reservation and just really working with the tribes and the tribal members and our outreach support person in that region is a part of the tribe and that makes a huge difference of just bringing in the voices that people listen to. Absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Grayson, anything you would like to add? Um, I, I share uh, the sentiments of, of my colleagues. Uh, wonderful advice. Um, making sure you know, the proper folks are on the, at the table is key. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, as we're brainstorming solutions, um, also understanding the the history of, of your program and how you got to, to where you are, because there's a lot of, you know, I'm sure you all um, have similar conversations where, you know, folks were like, well, that's just how we've always done it, or we've done it this way. And, um, and, you know, there could potentially be other ways and other approaches to doing certain things. So, um, and sometimes, and that helps when you have the different community members there. Um, definitely um, parent involvement. So, there, so with um, one of our districts, we have a um, an African American uh, parent advisory group, and we be sure, you know, we're sure to, to include them in our conversations. Um, definitely, uh, Omoja and and other different programs, not only at the college level, um, but also at the high school. So for example, our there's a family um, family center um, within our districts that really work with our Spanish speaking families. And so, um, you know, figuring out, you know, how can we get their involvement and support? Um, I love the student ambassador idea. I'm definitely gonna be contacting you, <laughs> Dr. Zhu about that, um, because I think that that's, a, that's very innovative. Um, and it's also a great way to get um, student leadership 
involved um, at the high schools, um, and then also to hear from the students, right? So how can we hear about the experiences that the students are actually going through? So really honoring that student voice and, and including that in your, um, in your solution finding. Great, thank you. So uh, another question that we had uh, in regards to the ambassadors actually was, do dual enrollment ambassadors do Zoom sessions or has a unique info session at each high school location? How often do the amb ambassadors host these info sessions? So um, Dr. Zhu? Yes, so this is our first semester trying this. Um, and so what I did is we had a regional training through Zoom because again, they're like three, four hours away from each other. So not gonna happen in person. And well, prior to that, we had interviews, we had them meet with us on Zoom, they had to actually show up, they went through the Mendocino College application process, so they got, got that kind of, you know, um, professional development opportunity, they had a panel of folks, we interviewed them, and then um, in December, we had them all, and I went through a training, we checked in with them, and then um, in the first of the semester for spring, they actually went into each of the classrooms and did this presentation and we were having strong communication with the high school counselors and the principal to let them out of their other classes to go into these other classes. And then I'm in good communication with them through email, but we're going to have a mid semester um, check in to see how things are going and then potentially something at the end. I don't know. I'm still working through it, figuring it out. One junior, one senior, though, that's the plan so that it can continue. And then we'll bring on a new sophomore this year and we won't lose any of that um, institutional knowledge. Great, thank you, Dr. Zhu. And uh, Vice President Fisher, I know you mentioned an ambassador program as well. Um, if you wanted to speak to that, but then a related question is, how do you pay for them and wraparound services? If you could share perspective. Yes, I, I love uh, Dr. Zhu's uh, um, student ambassador, I guess we'll say uh, program, because that's great. Um, that's I, I I think that as we kind of grow our program to where students are taking a, a lot more classes in a pathway, it's a fabulous idea. Um, ours are currently like our our student workers um, are are trained to be peer ambassadors for our outreach department, and part of that work is the dual enrollment process. So we we do both virtual and in person. Um, while during the the challenge was during um, COVID, uh, we weren't allowed to to send them in person, even though the schools were opening back up. We could not send our peers. That is why you see that drop, um, because the the hands on support was was no longer available. Um, this is the first semester actually where we were allowed to have them back. There were a little bit more of stipulations for this time. They actually had to get live scanned and TB tested, um, which we didn't have to do before the pandemic. I don't know that that was related at all, but um, it's just something that, that was implemented. And so we got them through that process. Now they're boots on the ground. We actually have them at a high school uh, twice a week. Um, so each high school gets a peer ambassador twice a week. And that seems to be the level of support that the high schools are, are comfortable with when last semester um, we were able to kind of start mid semester once we got them through that in um, that that onboarding process with the TB test and live scan and and it, we were only able to really get them in once a week and that wasn't enough support so but we do pay for them out of our budget so it is a it is a pretty hefty budget um, but that is it's how we see we can support until we grow our staffing and fix, kind of implement that technology that would more easily streamline um, the enrollment process. Uh, so it's kind of a, a pre-investment we're making to grow the program. Um, and, you know, ideally the apportionment that we get um, would, you know, would pay for those peers in the future. Vice President Fisher, when you said our budget, is it the VP office or just general funds or? It's our uh, included in our outreach budget. Got it. Thank you. The general you. funds, yeah. Gotcha. And uh, Dr. Grayson, uh, we have another question. I know you've sort of tried to navigate the online versus in-person. So I'll read this question uh, specifically. Maybe you can just share how you're navigating some of these questions or uh, dealing with this in practice. So the question is, we are seeing high school students gravitate towards our online modalities, on online and remote, compared to our in-person dual enrollment classes. This semester, we had to shift the modality a few weeks before the semester started from in-person to remote. 
uh, to save classes from getting canceled uh, for low enrollment. Um, is this something that others are experiencing and any suggestions on um, pushing classes back to in-person? So I know you've had a little experience with this, Dr. Grayson. So any sort of perspective or ways that you're navigating this in practice? Yes, yeah, so um, our schools are also preferring to, um, to keep our online asynchronous classes. It was... Um, it's interesting when I first came on board, you know, a couple of years ago, they were really pushing us to when are we bringing the classes back to campus? When are we bringing the classes back to campus? And but then we've seen this tremendous growth that the online classes have been able to allow us to do, um, especially for our smaller school districts um, that would not be able to, they, they've always struggled with filling an in-person class. And so um, the online classes has, you know, have allowed us to cross list section so we can have two districts in one, um, in one class. And so um, that relieves some of the burden of one district of having to fill a class. And it's just, taken off tremendously. We've seen some the numbers in some of these school districts just explode be, because of that, right? And they're able to have a wider variety of, um, of course, uh, options. Um, and so we approach them with, um, you know, moving more back to, to in-person um, classes this semester, uh, in fall, and they have all said, no, we, we want to keep these asynchronous options. So we're trying our best to explore how, how best to do that. Um, and with that, though, becomes, comes a lot of challenges because, um, you know, when you have that in-person connection with students, um, they're able to get their questions answered in a very timely manner. They're able to talk to their professors, you know, often. Um, they're able to develop those relationships. Um, and so we found some challenges with the, the online asynchronous environment where sometimes the faculty are not getting back to them um, in a timely manner. So there's there's pros and cons um, to, to this. And so I think that um, the, the best way we can expand um, you know, capacity to be able to support um, the students, um, those academic supports um, are, are key to their success. And that's actually the direction I'd like to go. Um, you know, we've been doing growth, 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 talking about access, access, access. Um, and I really want to, to slow that down and focus on, on success. Yes. I, I, I feel the need to step in also with some of the other challenges regarding asynchronous online, which have been um, showing up at our level. Uh, we're responding to many colleges here. I mean, dual enrollment, CCAP, you can do asynchronous online. And unfortunately, there's a, a, a misunderstanding that um, that, that, that the chancellor's office is saying that you can't do that online. That's not the case. The situation, however, is that if you do an asynchronous course online, <coughs> you need to be careful because by definition, that course cannot be a closed class. That class has to be open to any student uh, unless you use the cohort model so there's a limitation to enrollment 58, 168, uh, Title V section that says you can close a class if you use a cohort model. But if you're using a cohort model, your district needs to have in place policies around that. That, that same section outlines that a district uh, should develop policies on what's a cohort. It's not just like a, uh, you need a broad definition of what a cohort is and you need to be following your own district rules on the cohort and you can close a class if it is using the cohort model and your district would need to define what that cohort model is. But if you're not using a, a cohort model, you cannot close an asynchronous course because by definition on the course that can be closed is a course that's meeting on the high school campus during the regular school day. And asynchronous online is anytime, anywhere. So it fails to meet that definition as outlined in the education code. So, but I do, and then we're, we're responding to this because the growth has been significant. And I'm look, I'm, I am a big online distance education person. I oversaw and administered distance education 
in the chancellor's office for 25 years, going back to when it was offered as telecourses through the growth of online and everything. So I understand it and the nuances there. And, and Dr. Grayson, you're absolutely right. Many times when we begin to expand in online, it's all about uh, access and growth. And but there, when you're doing online asynchronous courses, the courses need to be designed in a certain way. They need to be other types of internal uh, mechanism put into place to assure student support and access. Because what happens is that the data shows that there's a significant drop in success and retention when it's online because the student is not as visible. Um, they're isolated. There are just so many other different things that can have a negative impact to just have an access tent. The, you need to be disciplined because you're not gonna have anybody like kind of riding you to get things done at a certain time. And you can put things off and before you know it, you look up and you are, you're behind. And because people don't know who you are, you're, you're almost anonymous to your other classmates, you can very easily drop out of those courses. And so I, I just wanted to, um, kind of come in with that statement. I really appreciate what Dr. Grayson had to say in that reference point, but I also wanna help dispel the rumor that the chancellor's office is saying that you can't do asynchronous online. You can do it to your heart's content. I always encourage people to, to, to take on those extra precautions and design issues for any online course. But if you're gonna do asynchronous and you're not gonna use the, the a cohort model, you do need to make those courses open to anybody. Great, thank you so very much for that clarification, Dr. Woodyard. Hopefully you all can reference this recording and the citations will also follow up as well, um, but there you have it. Um, as a final, final, maybe 30 second response from each of you as we transition to the grants, um, could you all each, um, and we'll just do a quick round robin, share whether or not uh, you've talked with your partnerships about applying for the grants, if they're applying for the grants, and maybe some of the activities uh, they may be writing in or that you suggest. So um, are they writing for the grants uh, and what should they write about? Uh, how about we start with Amanda, if you don't mind? Yes, so I've met with each of my partners, and again, we're small schools, so there's no dedicated grant writer anywhere. And so they're all interested in applying, and one of the things we're hoping to do with the funding is to actually buy out a high school instructor's prep to be an on-site dual enrollment coordinator for that location, and then have a larger professional development across our district by bringing those high school professionals together to have a co cohesive conversation. Thank you, Dr. Zhu. Dr. Grayson. Yes, um, two uh, or I would two of my districts out of the three are applying, and then our early college um, high school um, is applying. So, so one of our districts um, is trying to expand to create an early college um, program within their district, and so um, we're really excited about that. So they're transitioning one of their um, alternative high school campuses to an early college um, high school. Um, and then our larger um, district, um, Riverside Unified, they plan to apply for the for the CCAP grant. Um, and so um, he provided me a list of, so they're going to offer um, information workshops for their, um, for all of their counselors and um, secretaries at all of their high schools. Um, they're going to um, provide additional hours for their counseling. Um, they're going to provide um, additional hours for their uh, registrars to um, in, input their uh, grades and transcripts and make sure all of that is cleaned up in a timely manner. Um, and then um, helping with distribution of textbooks um, because for our, for our CCAP agreements, our um, high school, our high school districts uh, pay for the textbooks for the students. And so um, they're going to work on streamlining that system so that the students can receive their textbooks in a, um, you know, prior, prior to the first week of school, which has always been an issue for us. Um, and then um, they're also considering um, tutoring and um, additional planning time for, for their counselors. Thank you for that detailed response. I really appreciate it, Dr. Grayson. And finally, Dr. Fisher. 
Vice President Fisher. Thank you for giving me the degree. <laughs> um, foreshadowing. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Um, yes, uh, we met actually yesterday, so that was very exciting. Um, and our largest school district uh, with the 14 school sites and then some alternative schools and uh, four adult schools, uh, they, they are applying um, for with all of their school sites, I believe. So that's wonderful. Um, for, predominantly, we spoke about um, having the budget cover um, both from their side and our side, uh, faculty stipends to really build those pathways because that's kind of our next goal. We've started for, with a couple of pilot programs, but all the schools currently really only offer you know, transfer courses, but we really want to piggyback off of their already established career ed pathways that they have at the high school level to really create those to be dual enrollment pathways. Um, and then addition to the, and in addition to that on the CCAP grant side, um, we'd like to build in some counselor time to be at the high school sites. And then we discuss some textbook uh, costs and some out money for out, additional outreach. Uh, and then on the um, middle college, early college side, the, we are, um, they are going to apply for a middle college grant at our San Ysidro Higher Education Center. So we're extremely excited about all of that. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our presenters. Um, they will still be around uh, as they can. If you have additional questions, we will definitely try to help fill those for you. And right now I will turn it over to Dr. Castro to talk more about those grant opportunities. And then we will round out our afternoon. Thank you so much. Let's see if I can fix my Zoom background here. All right, there we go. Um, so, oh, so inspiring. Like, thank you all so, so very much. I'm just like blown away um, at how amazing um, your work is. So, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, let's jump on to the next slide. Um, I am going to go through these uh, fairly quickly. Um, and I know that um, we also did a webinar um, on uh, it, it, earlier um, that featured um, um, a dual enrollment exemplar uh, winner, Arvin High School and more, and as well as colleagues from the Department of Ed. And so um, uh, I put that recording and those slides in there too. So let's go ahead. We should be on side 38, funding opportunities. Uh, there we go. So there is $200 million available for dual enrollment. That's amazing. Um, half of which for CCAP expansion and half of which for early or middle college, high school startups and expansion. But before we talk about all of that, um, we also want to bring your attention to a grant um, opportunity that's going to be coming out probably this spring, a little bit later on, called the Golden State Pathways. This is actually $500 million, and it has many, uh, many similar elements. So we want you to think about these things together. Um, let's go to the next slide you'll see that the Golden State Pathways has a lot of things that we see in the dual enrollment grants also, that, that there's intense partnerships, that there it's pathways focused, and there's some priority pathways that the governor outlined there, um, that it's integrated college and career. None of this, you know, old fashioned CTE over here and traditional academics over there, it's, it's both. Um, and the Golden State Pathways also includes 12 units of early college credit. And if that is dual enrollment, it needs to be CCAP. So let's go on to the next slide. Speaking of CCAP, for, just as a quick review for our friends, um, CCAP, similar to the, the slide, it's one of the many ways to do dual enrollment, um, but it has some particular focused uh, uh, areas, pathways, um, design, closed classes, embedded supports, um, designed for students who are either um, underrepresented in higher education or who are just not college bound themselves and data sharing agreements. Uh, and uh, we'll go through the next couple of slides quickly. Um, next slide. Um, again, thinking about Golden State Pathways, how this lines up. Next slide. Um, embedded supports. And next slide, thinking about equity. Um, and so let's, let's see the next one. So let's get into the dual enrollment opportunity specifically. Again, there's those great um, uh, webinar that we already did. So we want you to consider, you know, looking at that. 
Um, the 100 million for CCAP. So this is brand new CCAP agreements. That, uh, that, that's something you can write for. You can write a grant for brand new CCAP agreements. You can also, if you already have CCAP agreements, you can expand your current CCAP agreements. So you can expand to have uh, more students included or um, you know, CCAPs are district to district, right? So if your district has five high schools, but only three of them are really up and operating with CCAP, you can write to expand to those other two high schools. Um, and then finally, you can, you can write a grant to expand um, for really intensive student supports, what all of our panelists were talking about, robust pupil advising, student success support services, and outreach campaigns, like those great, you know, parent outreach campaigns, let them know what dual enrollment is, um, is possible for their students. Um, and then the early and middle college awards are very similar, right? So you can start a brand new early college high school or a brand new middle college high school. You, if you have one of these kinds of schools, you can expand it to serve more students. That would be phenomenal. You can also add robust um, uh, student supports or more robust student supports. So, so this is all great news. The RFAs are there. The applications are fairly easy to read, but let's go, let's go ahead a little bit to the next slide. Um, this is the timeline. The RFAs were released in February. They are due this month. Um, by the end of the month on March 30th at 4 p.m., um, the grantees will be announced in June. The project term begins in July and funds will be dispersed in September. And you have all the way until June 30th of 2027 to spend the funds. So plan over, over the next um, couple of years. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there are allowables and unallowables. These are very similar to many state grants um, that you probably have already received. Capacity building, some of the examples that our, our colleagues gave all sound really fantastic. Establishing partnerships, time for people to meet. Enrollment, um, we all heard about the heartache with enrollment. And so you can, you can buy some technological solutions. You can invest in um, you know, people's time to problem solve, to automate, all that kind of great stuff. Um, student supports, collaboration, things that are not allowable. You cannot supplant. And this is a this is one that we're all familiar with. You can't buy like equipment uh, for administrators. You can't remodel a facility. Um, you can't buy textbooks for high school classes, but you can buy textbooks for college classes. Um, and you can't buy periodicals um, or subscriptions. Um, let's go on to the next one. So this is sounding good to you. You're like, yeah, let's do it. How do we apply? Um, LEAs uh, for this, these grants are school districts, charter schools, and county offices of education. But check this out. The awards are by high school. So if you have five high schools who all want to apply uh, in a particular district, the district would put in five different applications. Um, so one application by the, submitted by the district for high school. Um, yeah, and so, and then we also have the, uh, the, an email, but for asking more questions directly of the CDE, you can also ask questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, let's go on to the next one. Um, there's some priority areas. You get points for these in your application. Um, next slide, please. There we go. Um, if the, the school has higher than average dropout rates, rates of suspension or expulsion, or if the, the school is serving higher rates of homeless youth, foster youth, or justice-involved youth, um, or if the school has a lower than average, than state average A through G completion rate, and then they're also looking at unduplicated counts of students, English learners, economically disadvantaged, and so on. Um, and then these will be scored. Uh, if on the next slide, we can talk about the scoring. Very similar if you applied for the dual enrollment exemplary award, similar um, categories. There's an overview, a description of your partnership, there's pathway design. And in the description of that, they, they talk about uh, dual credit as part of the pathway design. Um, there's student supports and there's sustainability. Um, and then your reminder that CCAP is designed for students who are underrepresented in higher ed or who might not otherwise go to college. And there's also, um, there's, a, there's some other areas you get scored in as well. There's a budget narrative, which is a great chance to make the case, like we're spending this money because we think these things, student supports, for example, 
are going to really help our program get better and better um, and increase the number of students served. Um, there's also a letter of commitment for the college and a letter of support from the district superintendent. You better get on those because those take a while to get. Um, but all of that uh, leads me to another part of this awesome project that is included these communities of practice um, and that the chancellor office has you know, started and funded is they asked us to do a survey, a statewide survey. Um, and let's, let's hop onto the next slide. And I'm gonna put that survey, you're the first folks to, to see this. Um, uh, the survey was uh, an incredible opportunity. Maybe some of the folks on here took part in the survey. There were over 300 respondents from 85 colleges and 22 college districts. There were also some of our colleagues from K-12 and county offices um, also um, uh, responded. And they were asked two questions, to name the top barriers to implementation and the top barriers to um, uh, equitable access and success. And for implementation, the overwhelming barrier named was enrollment challenges. And the number four barrier named, which we, we kind of linked together because they're very uh, similar, was CCC apply difficulties. Next up, we had um, aligning schedules, you know, from high school to college, this is a challenge, um, and uh, lack of support staff. Um, so these are some of the, so these kinds of things might help you justify um, spending funding on certain areas, right? So um, support staff, um, tackling those enrollment challenges, things like that. And if we can go to the next slide, you'll see that, uh, Again, we see enrollment challenges at the very top, barriers to equitable access and success. Over half of the respondents said it was a lack of personnel to support enrollment. Now, um, you know, if things were more automated, uh, we might not need the personnel, right? Uh, you know, we might be able to just automate more. And so, uh, uh, you know, there's some great experiments going on around the state um, uh, working on that, the Fresno case, uh, Fresno Madera K-16 Collaborative has got some great stuff going on. Um, Kern County has some amazing things going on, different approaches, but they're automating. 50% um, said a lack of personnel to provide academic support. Again, echoing what our, what our panelists have said. And 36% said um, that it was gatekeeping on the part of the high school staff I will add in there that 15% also said it was gatekeeping behavior on the part of college staff. So that kind of speaks to this uh, shift in mindset and um, our attitudes about what high school students are capable of, um, as well as who dual enrollment is for. And oh my gosh, that was a ton of information in an incredibly short amount of time. So I'm gonna now hand it back over to Lorencia. Thank you, Dr. Castro. And just as part of our close, we wanted to um, remind you all that there is a dual enrollment equity conference that we are co-sponsoring with our colleagues in the Kern Community College District, along with Education Trust West, uh, that will be happening in May. And so uh, we encourage you all to come as a team, uh, come with your high school and college team uh, to learn from folks across the state, uh, have conversations, carry on the conversations that were started here um, to just see what's going on and get some better ideas or uh, perhaps share your innovations that you're doing as far as dual enrollment. So those links are in the chat as well. Um, if you, there's also an exciting uh, component on day two, you can actually do site visits uh, with some of the, I believe one of the sites is also one of the exemplary um, awardees uh, for dual enrollment. So you could actually see firsthand what is going on there. So please do not forget about that opportunity. Um, we definitely welcome, uh, thank you for everyone that has posed questions. We will definitely try to follow up with some of those as well. We also have a statewide base camp, which is a virtual platform where you all can interact with one another. Um, we have that information in the chat. We will also include that in the uh, follow-up email along with this recording. Uh, there's Dr. Castro and my uh, email if you have questions that you would like to email us directly. Again, the base camp is a virtual platform where you can ask these questions amongst your other dual enrollment peers, both we have an adult dual enrollment as well as a K-12 dual enrollment platform. So uh, with that, thank you all once more. Uh, Dr. Castro, please. We do have a couple of minutes left and there's two more open questions in the um, Q&A. Um, so Jennifer asked, 
is there agreed upon definition of a pathway? That is like a beautiful question. Um, CCAP actually defines pathways, but in a very broad way. So they say that pathways could be for high school graduation. They could be for um, CTE or for transfer or for um, college and career readiness. And I think the, the intent behind that is that a pathway leads to something, some kind of credential or degree or certificate, um, and that the courses are thought out. So they're not, they're not one-off courses. They're um, not random acts of dual enrollment. Um, and, then, uh, and then another question asked is, are high schools paying for college counselor support from college personnel under the CCAP grant? Um, and we don't, you know, so we haven't seen any yet. We haven't seen any of the applications, so we don't know. But that is certainly allowable. Um, and uh, and and I would say, you know, if if the the the, the high school is is the applicant, they're they're receiving the funds of the district. Um, if the services they need are services that are held by the college, um, it would benefit them to subcontract with the college and and you know um, work through that. But there's so many creative solutions. Um, so that would that would be my my advice. Um, and I'm sorry, Lorencia, <laughs> I'll, I'll hand it right back to you. No, I definitely appreciate that, uh, Dr. Castro. So again, I just wanted to extend our extreme gratitude to Vice President Fisher, Dr. Zhu, and Dr. Grayson for taking time. They're in all parts of the state at other conferences, but they took time to be here to share their knowledge with us and represent their institutions. So thank you, thank you. Uh, also, thank you to the other community of practice members that are on the call. We see you, we recognize you. Thank you for again, contributing to this space and the larger community of practice. Ed Insights, Chancellor's Office, thank you. And again, let's keep uh, all this advocacy and good work going and supporting our students for dual enrollment. Let us know if you have questions. Thank you very much. Yes, Dean Woodyard, we appreciate you in the IEPEI office. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you.